first of all, uh, uh, as the guilty look on my face suggests, the dog has continued to eat my homework when it comes to your homework. <laughs> However, I tell you what we're going to do. Uh, um, I've actually been, the, 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 I've come up with some extremely good but non-trivial problems. Um, and I think uh, um, uh, the other thing I'd promise to do is give a list of possible topics. So some people have been speaking to me about what they want to write about for their uh, term paper. Um, I will, in, on Tuesday, I promise, I promise, as a Thanksgiving present to ruin your Thanksgiving, <laughs> uh, I will uh, both um, uh, have uh, this list as well as uh, the, a problem set with a really a, a, a quite a large number of interesting problems. And you can choose to solve any one of those problems or even partially solve them if you want to talk to me about it uh, for, the, uh, for the term paper too. Remember, uh, as far as the term paper is concerned, I need an excuse to give you an A. Just any old excuse, perhaps slightly more than spelling your name correctly on your term paper, but only epsilonically more than that. Okay? As I said, this is Harvard. You're also wonderful. You deserve an A anyway. If you're out there in the world, people would be bowing and kissing at your feet in any case. So that's not true. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Sorry, you're not undergraduates. Uh, well, so, some, those of you who are undergraduates, that's true. Those of you who are grad students, it's not true. But, uh, <laughs> um, OK. Um, okay, uh, so, so today we're going to uh, uh, try to finish up uh, many of the um, important physical points about n equals 4 and the uh, uh, amplitahedron. Um, by the way, um, does anyone know when the last day of exams is? Whatever that day is, the day is your thing will be due. Um, and also, um, someone told me the last day of class is like really soon. Um, I didn't know that. So, uh, so uh, I, I mean, I wasn't assuming that we're going till Christmas or anything. But, but I thought it was, uh, uh, um, in any case, um, whatever the last day of class is, um, I don't care. Um, uh, you, you can stop coming, but I'll probably just keep going until the, uh, the middle of December, OK? Um, if you think I'm kidding, one of my uh, favorite classes that I ever took when I was an undergraduate ended up, actually I have two classes when I was an undergraduate that ended up having a class with two people in it, me and another guy. Um, both of the other guys are now uh, professors in physics and math. So it all worked out uh, very, very well for us. It, the only time it didn't work out is when both of us failed to show up for class. That was slightly sad for the professor. But uh, anyway, so I'm not proud. I will keep going um, uh, because there are a few more things. We, we'll finish talking about the amplitude uh, uh, for sure in the allotted time. But I wanted to say something about um, the same kind of very, very similar philosophically, but technically at the moment somewhat different, although uh, you know, with some interesting interrelationships. Uh, uh, objects in a much simpler setting of just scalar theories, phi cube theory, um, uh, where, the, uh, where the corresponding geometric structures are much less fancy than the amplitahedron. Um, they're just polytopes, and they're in fact, uh, they're, 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 they're classic, well-studied, beautiful, uh, understood from any points of view uh, in, in mathematics polytopes called associahedra and generalized associahedra. And they're associated with uh, uh, beautiful objects called cluster algebras, and I wanted to talk about those things as well. So I'll probably spend uh, um, uh, whatever the uh, two weeks is after the end of class, probably another four lectures if people want to hear about it, um, talking about that subject, uh, cluster algebras, cluster polytopes, and um, scattering amplitudes for phi cube theory, um, uh, a tree level and, and one loop. OK. Um, <coughs> But today we're going to talk about unitarity, factorization, and uh, uh, at least indicate all loop BCFW in momentum twister space. So these are the topics we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, first, let's um, uh, finish the uh, story from last time for uh, unitarity, the unitarity cut of n equals 4 a loop from the amplitahedron.
So remember what the, what the story is, is that we, we imagine we have the L loop n equals 4 amplitude, and the corresponding the L loop n equals 4 amplitohedron. This is some 4 times L dimensional space. I can think of it as you know, a bunch of lines in the space of a bunch of lines AB1 through AB sub L. And I associate it with these D matrices, D1 through DL. And because n equals 4, this is really a silly rewriting because these matrices are literally the same. Okay? So the, um, okay? And what we want to see is what happens uh, on a boundary of this space. Remember, uh, what is the space? Uh, the the, the all-loop amplitohedron is just this space where for each AB, AB12, blah, blah, AB14, all the minors are positive for each I, AB13 and AB24, they're all positive. Actually, sorry, that's not quite right. <laughs> Let me say it in the language of the. Let me just say it in the language of the D matrices. I have these D matrices D1 through uh, DL. They're all individually positive, and we have that DI DJ has also got to be positive. Okay, for all pairs I and J. Okay. But. What we're interested in is what happens when one of the lines AB, and remember AB is just D dot Z. Okay. So what we're interested in is what happens when one of the lines AB intersects uh, both 1, 2, and 3, 4. Okay, so that's like cutting two internal propagators. And from the picture, we see what it is that we should expect we should expect the, uh, to get a product of that four particle uh, amplitude and that four particle amplitude, but we, we're going to divide the loops up between them. Okay, so we're going to have L1 loops here and L2 loops there. And so what, what we should find is that if we make the D for, let's say, the ELF loop look like 1, 0, X, 0, 0, Y, 0, 1, so what this is now manifestly making A is equal to z1 plus xz2, right? And b is equal to, um, uh, uh, sorry, let, let, let me put, let, let me put a minus sign here. It doesn't really matter. Uh, z4 minus yz3. So if I, I have a cut like this, then um, I want to find that omega, that the canonical form, becomes dx over x dy over y uh, times the sum over L1 and L2, where L1 plus L2 is equal to L minus 1, of a left loop at these points z1 minus x z2, z2, z3, z4 minus y z1, and ml2 of uh, z1 z2 minus 1 over x z1, z3 minus 1 over y, z4, and z4. So those are these, these are these uh, intersection points on, on those lines. Okay, so <clears throat> so in order to do that, um, what we're going to see is how the amplitohedron itself um, breaks up in this configuration. And so, to uh, begin with, um, uh, just for dl, the positivity of dl just tells us that x and y are positive. And as far as everyone else is concerned, the mutual positivity of di with dl for everyone else just tells me that 2, 3, i plus x, y, 1, 4, i, minus x, 
1, 3, i minus y, 2, 4, i is positive. You remember, the totally general formula was di dj was the six-term formula that looked like 1, 2, 3, 4, i, j, plus 2, plus, uh, 2 3, 1, 4, i, j, plus the other ones, and it had two negative signs, 1, 3, i, 2, 4, j, minus uh, 2, 4, i, 1, 4, uh, 1, 3, j. So that's the totally general formula. And now we're specializing where one of them is L, where a bunch of minors of D are, are 0. Yes? Yeah, I'm just wondering, is your intuition for why you can't that it's Both, both. It also comes from uh, physics, right? The, 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 the intuition from uh, physics, yeah. what, 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 we should, what, what we want to see is the textbook unitarity cut. The uh, textbook unitarity cut would tell, would tell me that if I have something like this, and I put two intermediate particles on shell, that uh, that the unitarity cut yeah. is something like this, right? Where what I'd be getting here is some L1 and some L2. Right. Okay, so that's what that's our uh, with uh, at one lower loop, right? L1 plus L2 yeah. uh, equals L minus one, right? So that's our that's our the physics intuition. Well, that's that is unitarity, right? At least that's the cut level statement of unitarity, but and. Definitely not. <laughs> it's not obvious mathematically. And in fact, uh, uh, you, uh, as I've told you before, I've complimented you on this before. You're probably one of 20 people in the world who really understands this. This is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's not so much of a compliment. It's a statement about the year of the 21st century. In, the, in 1960, 1,000 people in the world, well, maybe 500 people in the world understood this. But anyway, um, indeed, unitarity is not obvious. Okay? Lorentz, that's the central tension of quantum field theory. Lorentz invariance and unitarity cannot be made obvious simultaneously. And if you want to prove the cutting rules, you have to go back to a non-Lorentz invariant representation uh, a la Veltman and Kutkowski and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's part of the exciting thing here is that we have some formulation. It doesn't look like any of those things, but these things are going to now be obvious. Okay? Um, uh, unfamiliar, but obvious. Okay, so that's the, and but but in, in any case, just say again. On the one hand, on the one hand, uh, that's what we expect from physics. That what's what we want to see. On the other hand, it's also a kind of a reasonable uh, expectation from the picture. You know, you have this quadrilateral. Now, uh, when I have this line that intersects, why not? You know, uh, it might want to split into two like this, and we want to see uh, uh, whether it does. Okay, but anyway, at the moment. Um, we're just starting with that configuration, and just the amplitude is going to tell us what that happens. Okay, so just to, uh, but just to say again, what the strategy is going to be. All we're going to do. So now we're on this cut. We're on this configuration. All we're going to do is just explore what these mutual positivity conditions are, and and that's just going to tell us. That's going to tell us uh, something about how the space breaks up. What the non uh, uh, what we're going to see in the next uh, five minutes now. Is, is that just this condition involving mutual positivity of everyone with L is going to break the space of everyone else up into two sets, naturally. So that's already the first interesting thing, is why does anything split in two at all? Right? There's nothing in this picture that looks like, well, uh, it's not obvious that anything should split in two. The first thing we're going to see is this is going to make things split in two in a natural way. It's going to very naturally motivate some shifted columns, some shifts, some natural shifts to make. And what we'll discover is that after we break it into two sets, you still think we have a lot of work to do to impose a mutual positivity between all the Ds. But the miracle is going to be that that turns out to be totally automatic. Okay, so that once we ensure that each D is positive with respect to L, they're automatically positive with respect to each other. Okay, and that's why the space just factorizes in cleanly into the product of two different things. Okay, just the mutual positivities of just these guys among themselves and the mutual positivity of the other guys among themselves, but as you'll see, with some shifted columns. And those shifted columns are exactly these shifts that, that we see here. OK? All right. OK, so, uh, so is it clear that, that this formula is just a specialization of this general case? right? I've just put a bunch of the minors of the DLs to 0. So, um, so that's what we learn. And actually, you can see this thing sort of uh, wants to factorize. Okay, um, almost wants to. Uh, uh, in other words, it almost wants to be combined into a 
into the product of two factors. And in fact, if I look at this combination, 1, 3 minus 1, 4, y, 1, 4, times 2, 4 minus x, One four, sorry, that's fine. Yes, good. All right, then this is actually um, this is uh, if if we use the applicable relation, this is one two three four plus one four multiplied by exactly this combination, which is positive. So this is positive. That's positive. So this whole thing is positive. OK, and so we find, therefore, thus, since that combination is positive, um, we, 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 can, we, we have to have either, either 1, 3 minus y, 1, 4 is positive, and the second term is positive, 2, 4 minus x, 1, 4 is positive, or the other way around, 1, 3 minus y, 1, 4 is negative, and 2, 4 minus x, 1, 4 is negative. All right, so I'm going to call these two, so all the rest of the d's have to break up into two sets. And there's some set for which the top condition is true, and there's some set for which the bottom condition is true. So I'll call the top set, uh, I don't know, I'll label them little a, and the bottom set capital A. And in fact, what are these conditions? It's natural to define some shifted columns. So let me define um, define three hat a is three a minus y four a, and um, and uh, two hat a is equal to two a minus x one a for the first region, and you see then all the conditions are just saying that one two hat. 1, 4, 2 hat, 3 hat, 2 hat, 4, and 3 hat, 4, for all the a's, are positive. So with these shifted columns, we see that with respect to the shifted columns, the d hats are just positive in the sense of the usual positive G24. So we know everything about these guys. Okay, similarly, for the other guys, uh, for the second region, I will define 1 hat A, capital A, to be 1 A minus 1 over X to A, and 4 hat A to be 4 A minus 1 over Y, 3 A. And I discover the same thing. So just uh, so again, all these, all the, all hatted minors are positive. Okay. So, um, so we've discovered that uh, that the first region, the first region is characterized just by all these lines being in positive G24, just with, some, just with some shift. Similarly, the second region, everyone is in positive G24. And now the miracle. The miracle is that all of the dA, little a, d big A, are automatically positive. Once all of this is true, are automatically positive. And that's a computation. Okay, so uh, how do you do it? Well, you just write everything backwards, right? So I, I write for, for example, I write for, for little a's, 
I write 4a, sorry, I write 3a is 3 hat a plus y 4a. Uh, 2a equals 2 hat a plus x 1a. Okay, and similarly for the other region, I shove these into the formula for di dj. I get a big expression involving lots of plus signs and minus signs and uh, hatted minors. And slightly miraculously, all the minus signs cancel out, and I get an expression with all plus signs. Okay, so these are automatically positive. All right. Meanwhile, what about the internal positivities between the d's? See, we also have to have the di, di, d little, d little a, d little b's are all positive. But the d little a, d little b's are the same as a d hat little a, d hat little b's, because all I've done is do a linear transformation, right? So that doesn't change any of the uh, determinants, any of the four by four determinants. Okay, so so the and and uh, and uh, mutual d a, d b positive is the same as d hat a d hat b positive. And similarly for, for the other guy. OK, so that's it. So that tells us that the space factors uh, for any way of dividing the remaining loops into L1 and L2, the, the space factors into the product of two lower amplitohedra with these shifted columns. Okay, but the shifted columns are completely equivalent to just shifting the external data. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's trivial. Um, for example, if I look at each loop, the shifts, uh, uh, the, the shifts in D uh, are actually undone by shifts in the Zs simply by the following. After all, I care about D. So I want to write L as D dot Z. So this is D1, Z1 plus uh, um, I want to write it like this. Um, so this is uh, so d hat dot z is um, uh, is one z one plus two hat z two plus three hat z three plus four hat z four, which is nothing other than original one z hat one plus original two z hat two plus original three z hat three plus original four z hat four with the z hats. Um, so where this d hat is like z1 minus xz2 and so on. z4 minus yz3. Okay. So, so the new space uh, that I get with all the d hats is positive. Uh, the image of d dot z is the same as the image of the d hat times these shifted columns. Okay. So, um, all right. So that's it. So from here, we get uh, the unitarity cut from positivity. All right. OK, now I want to go back and um, go back to tree level. So instead of going through the kind of most general discussion of unitarity, um, for a totally general k, n, k, and l, I'm sort of illustrating what's happening with, uh, with the various parts of it. So at four points, all the sort of magic in the geometry is about this mutual positivity of all these lines. And as I've stressed many times, this is not something that's even particularly well understood 
the geometry is not well understood, the combinatorics, geometry, whatever it is, is not remotely as well understood as it is in the case of the positive Grassmannian. But in any case, we can understand enough to do this simple exercise to show that we get the unitarity cut. Of course, there's many, many other things that we'd like to uh, uh, understand. Um, so now I want to go back to tree level, uh, but now for general K. Okay, so that now we're doing a, another, another extreme, back to tree level, but for general K and N. For any old K and N, I want to explain why we get tree level factorization from the amplitohedron, from the tree amplitohedron. And um, uh, just to keep something in mind, what do we expect in momentum space? Remember, in momentum space, we expect that we have a singularity when some pi plus dot 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 plus pj minus 1 squared goes to 0. And the residue is this factorization channel that looks like this picture that we've drawn many times. So we have some i and an i plus 1 and a j and a j plus 1. And if we had some representation of the amplitudes as a sum over Anschau diagrams or BCFW or whatever, we would expect to see this factorization on that, on that pole. Right? The object would have a pole and the residue on the pole would factorize into a left and a right like this. So part of what we have to figure out is what this means in momentum twister space. right? And um, already we know in momentum twister space it's a little more interesting. We have to see these lines. So this is in, in momentum space. In momentum twister space, already the sort of geometry we need to see is that this line i i plus 1 intersects j j plus 1. Right? And there's some intermediate point i that makes an appearance uh, that has to enter the amplitude and so on. Okay? So, this is, so this is just stuff to keep in mind to be on the lookout for. But now, again, we're going to forget about it, just go back to the amplitohedron and see what the amplitohedron is telling us. Okay? And once again, zeroth order question, why is something splitting in two? Right? Where is any kind of this splitting in two coming from? So uh, first, to, just to say something simple, let's go back to a polygons. So if I give you a, total, uh, uh, a random polygon and I give you a point on the inside, as we've said many times, now y is, looks like c dot z. c is just somewhere inside the positive Grassmannian g1n, uh, which just means some bunch of positive numbers. That's all I know. And it is not remotely unique how you write c in that way, how you write y in this way. Right? There's lots and lots of different positive c's that can write it like this. But there is something cool. There is something nice, which is that if y goes to a boundary, so in the interior, y cannot uniquely be written as c dot z, right? But on a boundary, let's say here on this boundary 2, 3, let's say y is on this boundary, then on that boundary, I can uniquely write it as something positive times z2 plus something positive times z3. Okay? So, so y on the boundary does look like just, it's a particular one-dimensional cell. A particular one-dimensional cell of G1n is lighting up in this case, and I can uniquely write it as C2z2 plus C3z3. Well, up to the overall GL1. So I can rescale C2 to 1 anyway. Up to, but, but I don't have any ambiguity in how I'm writing it like this. OK? OK, now that statement generalizes for any k. Um, uh, sorry, that, 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 that statement generalizes for the, for the, for the amplitude and also for any k. So for example, if I uh, go to k equals 1, uh, so the polygon, remember, is k equals 1, m equals 2. If I do the NMHV amplitudes, which is the, N, the NMHV amplitohedron, which is k equals 1, m equals 4, then k equals 1, m equals 4, 
then on the boundary where y, zi, zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1 goes to 0, so this is just k equals 1, so on this boundary again, y can uniquely be written as alpha 1, z1, plus alpha 2, z2, plus, uh, uh, sorry, i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. can be uniquely written like that. Let's draw a couple of pictures of this, uh, two pictures. Picture number one is a, a projective picture. So projectively, there's a little tetrahedron, right? There's i, i plus one, j, j, j plus one. And so, so y is somewhere in this tetrahedron. So I don't know, there's i, i plus one, j, and j plus one. Okay. I say projectively because, remember, in this, uh, in this case, um, the, the z's are five vectors, y is a five vector, but four of them are just give me a, uh, a so the whole space is uh, projectively four-dimensional. But four of them are just defining a three-dimensional subspace in the projective space. And the saying that y is in there somewhere just means that y is somewhere inside this tetrahedron. Okay? So this is a projectivization of the, uh, of the picture in, in the five-dimensional y space. That's one picture. A second picture is not projective. I mean, it's very simple, but... but we're going to go back and forth between these pictures. It's important not to confuse them. The second picture, I'm also go going to go down to a lower dimensional picture. Okay? Um, but in this picture, I'm going to imagine everything is five dimensional, but I'm going to project through y. Okay? Now remember, when I project through y, I go down to a four dimensional picture. Right? Th those four components are the usual momentum twister components. That's what, we're, that's what this whole story is about. Okay, so now in that picture, y has gone to the origin. Now I have a bunch of four vectors, zi, zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1. y is at the origin. So I can further conveniently draw the picture by projectivizing again. <laughs> okay, so just, there's just a bunch of vectors, y is at the origin. So if I projectivize again, that's the usual picture of momentum twisters in P3. Right, just the usual picture of momentum twisters in P3. So uh, the picture of the momentum twisters in P3 is now that i and i plus 1 and j and j plus 1 are actually intersecting at this point i. OK? So I want to stress these are two different things. Remember, in the amplitudehedron picture, the z's are fixed. The external data z's, and I'm moving around with y. right? And what I'm saying is that when you move around with y, so that y ends up inside this tetrahedron, i plus 1, jj plus 1, what that means for the projected data, when you project through y to get the momentum twisters, is that the momentum twister configuration intersects uh, at this point i. In this picture, there's a unique point, i, right? Back here, there are sort of two natural points. You could call them, they both would go to i under the projection. But there's this point on this line, i, i plus 1, namely alpha i, z i plus alpha i plus 1, z i plus 1. OK, and there's another natural point on this line, j, j plus 1. So there are two different natural points, non-projectively, that are associated with this configuration, once you decide that you're putting y inside. OK? Is that clear? So we're just done. The, so just sometimes we have to keep these two different pictures in mind. As far as the amplitude and geometry is concerned, we really care about, we're not projectivizing anything. Right? We really have five dimensional vectors. There's some geometry living in that space and, and, and so on. But as far as our uh, expectations from what should happen in momentum twister space, we have to project. And then we draw these pictures in uh, P3. So this is a picture in P3. And it just happens to lie in a plane, because in this configuration, i plus 1, jj plus 1, end up having to lie in some plane in uh, P3. Okay. 
Now, so now let's uh, generalize to any k. For any k, so y, you remember we have some y alpha. So, um, and uh, I want to say that y, so this is really, uh, we, what, what we've been writing is y zi, zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1. Remember, this is an, an abbreviation for like y1, y2, blah, 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 yk, i, I plus 1, jj plus 1. So clearly what we know from being on this boundary is just this information that one of these y's lies inside that tetrahedron. In other words, it says that this k-plane intersects that tetrahedron. So that means that there is one of these y's lives in that tetrahedron. The rest can be anywhere. We don't know where, where, where the rest are yet. OK? So that's why I'm going to break these up. It's, uh, uh, it's natural to break them up into a y1 and the y everyone else. Let's call it uh, alpha tilde. So I have some y1i and some y alpha tilde i. So alpha tilde will now run from 1 to k minus 1. And y1 has got to lie inside. y1 looks like alpha i, zi, zi plus 1, alpha j, zj, beta j, beta j plus 1, zj plus 1. OK. So that tells us that on this boundary, just as in the simpler examples, it's exactly the same uh, argument. I'll leave you to just sprinkle the extra indices on to convince yourself that it's true, but it's exactly the same argument. Just like in the polygon cases, the structure of the C matrix is nailed when you go to the boundary. The same thing is true here, just not for the whole C matrix, but we know what one row of the C matrix looks like. We know that the top row, we know that we can write y is equal to c dot z, where c looks like where, where c looks like, at the moment, all we know about it is that there's some i, i plus 1, and j, j plus 1 somewhere. So it's non-zero here, zero everywhere else in the top row, and at the moment, just any old block down here that I'll call c tilde. I don't know anything else about c tilde yet. OK? All right. OK, but now, once again, positivity is going to do something remarkable. So nothing interesting happens at k equals 1. right? For k equals 1, the C matrix is already just the top row. And we already learned what, 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 what we learned. right? We just go to the, uh, to the boundary. By the way, um, why aren't we seeing the product of two things? That's because we're in momentum twister space. So for NMHV amplitudes, k equals 1, they should factorize into the product of two k equals 0 amplitudes. And remember, k equals 0 is 1 in momentum twister space. So that's why we're not seeing anything. right? This is, uh, this is because we've just gone down um, uh, in the act of going from momentum space to momentum twister space, turn the MHV amplitudes to 1. So the first time we're going to see anything interesting, um, uh, or more non trivial So this is already correct, right? But it's a little trivial that it's correct. Um, the first time we're going to see something interesting is for k equals 2. We're still not going to see two things, but, we'll, but we should still see well, how should k equals 2 factorize. We should fa factorize into k equals 1 on one side and k equals 0 on the other side, or the other way around, right? So we should still see there are sort of two components that we can possibly have out of this, uh, out of this problem. It should still break into 2. So where is this breaking into 2 coming from? OK, so now let's look at k equals 2. Let's look at a k equals 2 C matrix, and what does it look like? OK, so it looks like, again, star, 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 where we have i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Let me just draw them sort of far apart from each other. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? It's a lot of zeros. OK? All right. Now, here's a, here's a cool thing about this uh, matrix. Let's say that it, anywhere in any of these components, I have a non-zero entry. OK? So let's say that anywhere between 
i plus 1 and j, there's some non-zero entry here, x. Now, without loss of generality, I can always do a GL1 rescaling to make this top component 1 or something positive. So that tells me, what does that tell me? That tells you that x is positive. Because I have to have this, remember, this, the minor of this is a, just a 2, I only have things in this bottom row now, right? This is just a 2 by n matrix. But just asking, because there's a 0 up here, just asking for this minor to be positive tells me that x is positive. Let me be, say this a little more symmetrically. Let's say I just call that alpha i, but I can make it positive. So alpha i is positive, so x is positive. And then the next minor over tells me that also alpha i plus 1 is positive. All right? Now, what about this guy? This guy's got to be negative. So let's call this negative beta j. Similarly, negative beta j plus 1. And now there's something very cool. If there's anything non-zero in here, everything underneath there has got to be zero. Why? Because alpha is positive, so that would force that entry to be positive. But beta, this is negative, so that would force that entry to be negative. So it has to be zero. Okay. All right, so you see that uh, just the nature of this configuration with two and i plus 1, jj plus 1 on the top row tells you something really cool, that the kind of C matrices you're allowed to have split into two different kinds. <laughs> One kind is allowed to be non-zero anywhere from i. I didn't say anything about what was down in these entries. So in principle, it could be anything from here all the way uh, to this column. So I could have something non-zero in here and zero everywhere else. That's one way. And the other way is the other way around, right? It have to be uh, non-zero everywhere through here and zero down here. Is that clear in this example? So we see that it splits into two. And in fact, it's very easy to prove in general that just positivity with that top row. So we're already starting to see the C matrix exhibits factorization. And it looks like, it looks like this, uh, i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. So what it can look like in general is, uh, that's the top row. We can have one block called C tilde L with some K1 of them. And I can have another block C tilde R wrapping around, right? With some K left and some K right. OK? Yes? Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, th th this is what it looks like. So, so it's just uh, 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 any way of, have, uh, any way of uh, arranging them to be uh, non-overlapping like this is uh, allowed. So it just, it, it, it's just the other case we had one of the k's was 0. So, so we just have a splitting into k left and k right with k left plus k right equals to k minus 1. OK. OK. Now, I haven't told you. I'm not telling you that the minors of this matrix are positive or anything yet, right? I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm just telling you this is what the C matrix looks like. But clearly, this C matrix is somehow built out of something involving an, a left C matrix of some sort and a right C matrix of some sort. And I have to add three degrees of freedom for you know, minus one projectively. So I want to add three degrees of freedom associated with these, whatever these variables are, i plus one, jj plus one upstairs. OK, so there should be some playback graph. Now, this is going to be a momentum twister playback graph. 
This is not going to be interpreted as an on-shell diagram. It's just a playback graph. But we know that all the cells of the Grassmannian are associated with a playback graph. So what playback graph do you think could possibly be associated with a configuration like this? OK, well, let me just write down the answer. Um, and then we'll see why, at least I'll motivate why it has to be right. But I'll leave it to you to, uh, if you want to explore it more, uh, to convince yourself that it's true. But if nothing else, um, something that you should see in this course and in this subject is that um, Uh, you have to get the right answer first, almost all the time. Um, sometimes you can slavishly derive things, but very often you have to run into the right answer first and then understand why it's true. And this is such a beautiful example that I can't resist just writing down the answer, and then you'll see why it has to be true. So the answer is a playback graph that looks like this butterfly. Okay, notice I'm not putting tildes here, right? So this is, this is what the matrix looks like. But I'm telling you that, that matrix arises from this playback graph, this kind of playback graph. And here you have i and i plus 1 and j and j plus 1. OK? This is a playback graph in, again, this is the momentum twister. This is the momentum twister uh, Grassmannian. First of all, um, whatever degrees of freedom we have in C left and C right, we need to be adding 4. What are the 4 minus 1, right? What are the 4 minus 1? These four faces. So those are the four extra variables that we've added, minus 1. Okay? So we get 4 face minus 1 extra equals 3 extra variables. Secondly, what is the k of this whole configuration? The k should be k left plus k right plus 1. Right? Notice in here, I, I have this black vertex, uh, and I've, I've drawn the black vertex uh, uh, not, I haven't, I haven't uh, written it as a, uh, as a cubic diagram. Remember, we could do the merge on merge for uh, black or white vertices. I find it convenient just to merge them all together here. So remember, these black vertices of k equals 2, the white vertices of k equals 1, what would this black 4-valent vertex have? It has k equals 3. As a 4-valent vertex, it has k equals 3, because it's the same as the k of adding of that picture, which is 2 plus 2 minus the 1 for the intermediate. Okay? So in general, the, in general, the white vertices for any valency are always k equals 1. The black vertices for any valency are uh, n minus 1. <laughs> if there are n lines going into them. So this says k equals 3. OK, and if you add up all the k's minus the number of internal lines, you find that you exactly uh, uh, get one more degree of freedom. Okay? So, so you get one more k. So the k left is just k, k left plus k right plus 1 is correct. All right, finally, we can look at this and think of this as a graph in momentum twister space. Right? Um, uh, we have not been doing this. Uh, when we looked at the onshell diagrams, we interpreted the lambdas, with the black and the white vertices, as telling us the, the conditions on the lambdas and the lambda tildes that were incident on that vertex. But let's just quickly say what the rules are for black and white vertices in momentum twister space, because they're even simpler. Right? So what is the rule for, what is the rule for a black vertex? So let's say I have some ZA, ZB, and ZC. The black vertex saying that C dot Z equals 0. C looks like 1, 0, x, y, 0, 1. So this just says Z1 plus x, Z2 is 0. Uh, y, Z2 plus Z3 is 0. So this just means that Z1, Z2, and Z3 are all parallel to each other as four vectors, which means that in P3, if I drew a picture in P3, it just means that they're on top of each other. Z1, 2, 3 are on top of each other. And what does, so that's what the black vertex means. What does a white vertex mean? ZA, ZB, ZC. Now, this is just the linear relation that, that 
C1 ZA plus C2 ZB plus C3 ZC equals zero. And what is that? That's just a statement in P3 that one, two, three, line a line. A, B, C, line a line. I don't know why I'm switching notation so much. Sorry. Okay. So, all right. So the black vertex says that the momentum twister variables touching that vertex must all be identified. <laughs> They're on top of each other. The white vertex says they have to line a line. So what is this picture telling us? This picture is telling us that, let's call this white vertex here alpha, this one beta. So I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to call the momentum which are associated with this alpha and this one beta. So this vertex is telling us that there is an alpha somewhere on the line i, I plus 1. So there's an alpha somewhere along this line. This vertex is telling us there's a beta somewhere on the line jj plus 1. But this vertex is forcing the alpha and the beta to be the same as each other. OK, so that forces the lines to intersect. Okay, and alpha and beta are on top of each other. And the same black vertex tells me that this intermediate line and that intermediate, this intermediate z and that intermediate z are just that intersection point. OK? So this is looking really good, right? So this picture adds the correct number of degrees of freedom. It has the correct k and is enforcing precisely the factorization condition that we expect to see in momentum twister space. Okay? And the claim is that uh, this is exactly that the C matrices that look like that come from playback graphs that look like that. OK? OK, and now we're almost done to prove factorization. Because it's also easy to see either by thinking about what these face variables are, or by doing a boundary measurement. Uh, there, there are many ways of, of doing this, but, but it's also, again, it's so intuitively clear uh, that this is what the answer should be, but you can really verify by doing the boundary measurements properly. That, you, you remember, from this configuration, I'm making a matrix. The, the, the C tilde and the C tilde left and the C tilde right. But furthermore, C tilde left dot Z will be C left, the, on the left here will be C left J plus 1. Uh, this is the C tilde, but will be the C associated with just the matrix that I make here. C left ZJ plus 1 plus dot 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 plus C left I ZI. And then there's a, there's a last. There's a last leg for CL, the one with I, but who is it going to, what, what is it going to hit? It's exactly going to hit ZI, alpha I, ZI, plus alpha I plus 1, ZI plus 1. Another way of saying this is that what this matrix is doing is putting C left and C right together and then shifting the I and I plus 1 columns, uh, 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 shifting, I shifting I plus 1 uh, adjacently. So we know those adjacent shifts are, are what we're allowed to do um, that preserves positivity. We can interpret this picture as adding bridges in an, in, in an appropriate way. And so that's what we're getting here. So, so uh, this uh, uh, the the C left dot Z is is equal the C left tilde dot the Z's that we see in the columns is these C's with a last shift uh, uh, to define the uh, intermediate guy, and similarly C tilde R dot Z is the same thing. C R I plus one that i plus 1 plus dot dot plus cr j plus 1 and some beta j z j 
with beta j plus 1, z j plus 1. Okay. So what do we learn from all of this? So on this boundary, y1, of course, is inside i i plus 1, j j plus 1. y left is inside c left dot z l. And y right is inside c right uh, dot z right. Where the left includes well, where 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 z left is the set j plus one dot 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 i, and capital I is equal to uh, this alpha i z i plus alpha i plus one z i plus one. Let's call that i for the left guy, and on the right. Um, uh, it's the complementary set. So we start from i plus 1, j, uh, and i right is beta j, z j, plus beta j plus 1, z j plus 1. And we know that the c is positive in the sense of the positive Grossmannian. The, the c left and the c right are positive. They're coming from these playbook graphs. The last thing we have to say is that we, we know that the data of the z's is positive. All the z's is positive, in the sense that the, the z minors are positive. But the z left minors are also positive, and the z right minors are also positive. Because all I've done, because this set, all the minors of this set, they're all ordered. And all I did is take an i and shift it by a neighbor. Right? So all of these minors are positive. The left minors by themselves are a positive chunk. The right minors by themselves are a positive chunk. Okay. So these are also positive. And these are also positive. And therefore, we've learned that on this boundary, the amplitohedron A and K looks like it has a piece with y1, the intersection with the plane i plus 1, jj plus 1, is somewhere uh, in that tetrahedron. But then times a and left and k left for z left and zi times the lower amplitohedra, just a direct product, n right, k right, z right, and zi. And of course, I have to sum over all the ways of dividing the k's. Okay? So they're all different things. So the amplitohedron just geometrically breaks up into a direct product of a bunch of lower pieces in exactly the way you would expect from factorization, including the intermediate particle coming into existence and all of the rest of it. Okay, so. So, but this is where the magic is. Okay, so all the magic is that first positive first, there's the earlier magic, the positivity forced the only boundaries were i plus one, j j plus one to begin with. Okay? But once you know that, you go to that boundary and you see that the C matrix has got to be have a, such a special form because of positivity that it's forced to descend, it's forced to be associated with graphs that look like they're factorizing. And then you follow your nose. Okay, then I'm not filling in all the uh, details, uh, uh, but there's, it's, there's nothing hard. I mean, you just have to just follow it up. OK, now, that tells you this is some kind of factorization. Why is it our factorization, the one that we really want? And that has a very, very, very pretty and simple explanation. It's the only one it could be, again, of course. So. What, what is the explanation going to be? What was a factorization that we wanted back in momentum space? So let me uh, just, just say, uh, in, in the momentum uh, in, the, in, in, in momentum space, Grassmannian, g k hat n, we have some c hat that comes from some playbook graph. 
and association some permutation sigma hat. And we know that this goes in momentum twister space to some other graph, different looking graph C, and a sigma, which is given by sigma of A is sigma hat of A minus 1 minus 1. Okay, so we know how the permutations are related to uh, each other. And so the claim is that this is just exact. So on the C hat side, if I give you something that looks like C hat left, C hat right, so we talked about this already. This is a, as a very simple consequence on the permutation. On, it gives you a new permutation out of the permutations that you had for the left and the right, basically just mapping. There was some guy in here that was going to i. It's no longer going to i. It's going to get mapped into the image of i on the other side. And similarly, some guy from here that was going to i is going to get mapped into someone on this side. OK? So the claim is that whatever that, that the, that whatever permutation you get from this, so sigma factorization, that the picture that takes this sigma and does that to it is exactly the butterfly that we drew. And you can, have, you can both try to prove this directly. You can have a lot of fun with it in some specific examples. Okay, but, but anyway, that is the claim, is that the, is that the factorization in momentum space when you descend to momentum twister space, um, what, the, what the permutation uh, does is fully encoded by doing something to the permutations on the left and the right directly in momentum twister space as given by this butterfly. OK. OK, okay so any, any questions? So now we've seen uh, two different settings. One was the all loop four point. <laughs> Okay, so MHV all loop four point, very different positivity problem, right? There's all this mutual positivity. Most of the Grassmannian positivity was kind of trivial. But anyway, there we have this uh, kind of simple junior high school kind of problem but involving pairs of, uh, uh, pairs of points and lines that were obtuse relative to each other and so on. And that problem, when you go to the appropriate boundaries that cuts, that gives you a unitarity cut, we saw that the geometry tells you that the space splits in two. And, and actually factorizes into two pieces in some canonical way. It's a very similar, very similar structure. In that case, there was this little two form, dx over x, dy over y, that tells you exactly where a, b is. And the product downstairs is not static. It's sort of like fibered over that, right? So as you move x and y around, you know, how the product is realized is moving around. We had these shifts in the, we had these shifts in, in, the, in the external data in the previous example, right? Or the shifts in the d matrices. Something very similar here. Now for the tree amplitohedron, you go on the boundary where y i plus 1, j j plus 1 is, uh, is 0. There is a four form that tells you where involving these variables, alpha i, alpha i plus 1, alpha j, alpha j plus 1, a three form, project uh, a three form that tells you where you are inside that tetrahedron. And then the rest of the space is a direct product of two lower amplitohedra that, of course, depends on exactly where the y is, right? So you move y around exactly what the two amplitohedra will move around, but it's the same kind of structure. Okay? You have some, uh, a little simple piece that tells you where you are on the factorization channel, and then the rest is uh, 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 fibered over a direct product of two lower uh, amplitohedra. OK, any questions? If you want to do something simple, um, just to convince yourself, this is really where, where all the magic is. Okay? So just seeing that this butterfly uh, uh, is what, what you get by just dropping the permutation by one and cycling down is, uh, is, is, is the uh, fun part. OK. Now, now that we've seen what factorization is supposed to look like 
in momentum twister space. Uh, I, I hope you also uh, now see why I, I've been saying for a month, let's wait, let's wait, let's wait uh, to talk about uh, BCFW and momentum twister space. Because if we wanted to directly just jump to, uh, you know, we can do it in principle, no problem. We know what the map is. If we want to directly jump to BCFW and momentum twister space, the butterfly has got to hit us immediately. That's the first thing we have to understand, right? And so this is kind of a slightly, slightly fancy thing, right? This, this slightly fancy thing is, is, is uh, I think, much more naturally motivated from the picture of what the Grassmannian matrices look like. Um, of course, you can slavishly derive it. And, and we did slavishly derive it as well. But, um, but uh, uh, it's much more natural once you have, uh, once, once we have this sort of larger set of ideas under our, uh, under our feet. Um, but that's what factorization looks like in momentum twister space. So let's just say it again. So uh, in momentum twister space, um, uh, what you get when you go on a factorization channel is the amplitude literally factorizes into a product, into a product of uh, an amplitude on the left, an amplitude on the right, with some interesting shifts that, we'll, uh, that we can read off from the, from the uh, uh, playback graphs. <coughs> but um, now that we know what factorization looks like in momentum twister space, let's, let's just do BCFW in momentum twister space. Okay? So now we're back. Forget about the geometry. We just want to do BCFW in momentum twister space. And uh, So you should expect that what BCFW is going to be is just adding one bridge to this picture. Okay, Just adding one thinking bridge to this picture. The question is where to put the bridge. Okay. And so let me label these as like n and 1, just sort of canonically. So I'm always BCFW in the same place. It doesn't matter. Um, the answer turns out to be that we put the bridge here. So it looks a little bit funny, but we have to put the bridge there. Um, you can sort of convince yourself that you can't put a. That it, well, let, let's actually see. Let's actually see. Uh, well, that's what the answer ends up being. But we can sort of motivate it uh, uh, very easily. Um, <clears throat> let's go. Let's go back and try to do the BCFW philosophy again, right? Remember, the, the BCFW philosophy in momentum space was that um, we know where the poles of the amplitude are, and we know how they factorize on the pole. But instead of looking at the function of many complex variables, let's just go off in one direction of the complex plane. Right? That was the point. Just in one direction, and try to understand what happens um, as a function of that one variable. And as a function of that one variable, we'll have many poles that correspond to just the poles of the amplitude, whose residues we know. And there's also a pole at infinity in principle, which uh, some magic had to happen in order, in order, in order uh, to know that it was 0, right? That, that, that we didn't have to worry about the pole at infinity. OK, but let's now do exactly the same thing. Now we have a, a tree amplitude is a function. Uh, uh, the, the tree amplitude is a function of all these ZAs and the super guys, so the super ZAs, the super ZAs. Um, and I want to also explore this in one direction in the complex plane, right? Except it's much easier than in momentum space. For example, in momentum space, we have to deform two particles in order to have momentum conservation, right? In momentum twister space, all the Zs are they're all generic. They're all that, that was the point, right? So what should we do? I want to deform a particle. I want to get just one complex parameter. I just hit one guy. That's it, right? So what we're going to study is what happens as, let's say, Zn goes to Zn plus some little z Zn minus 1. Of course, in principle, we could do anything. We could do go off in any direction on the complex plane. But we'll see in a second why going with one of the neighbors is a good idea. 
Okay, so we're just going to go with one of the uh, just going to go with one of the neighbors. I'm just choosing to go backwards. Okay. Now to see why that's a good idea, let's remember what are all the poles. All the poles of M tree are when i i plus one j j plus one goes to zero. So the only poles that are going to be affected, the only poles that will depend on this little z, are the ones that involve n. Right? But then who are the ones of this sort that involve n? The ones that involve n are n minus 1, n, j, j plus 1, and n1, j, j plus 1. These are the only things, these are the only poles involving n at all. But now if I replace n by this n of z, You see, this doesn't depend on z, because I shifted n by n minus 1. Right? So this is z independent. So these are the only poles that depend on z. Right? So this will be you know, n1 jj plus 1 plus little z n minus 1 1 jj plus 1. So you see, that's why it's such a good idea to just shift with one of the neighbors. Right? Only one kind of pole occurs. OK? All right. Well, so what are those factorization channels? And by the way, uh, um, uh, when I mentioned earlier in the course that at some point we're going to be drawing pictures in P3, left, right, and center, and lines intersecting planes, blah, blah, all day long, this is what I was referring to. Okay? Amongst many other things, this is actually, it gets more interesting. Uh, uh, but this is already one of the sort of simplest examples. So, um, so what are we doing? Um, I'm shifting. Here's n, and here's n minus one. Okay, and I'm the the shift that I'm doing is to shift n somewhere along this line, n minus one n. Right. So, <coughs> I then want to see when does n of z 1 jj plus 1 equals 0. That means that at some point along this line, somewhere this line intersects the plane. This is the plane 1 jj plus 1. OK? And where it intersects the plane 1 jj plus 1, let's call this point n hat, n hat for j, which is just this intersection point, n minus 1 n, intersect 1 j j plus 1, otherwise known as uh, n minus 1 1 j j plus 1 z n minus n 1 j j plus 1 z n minus 1, explicitly. Okay? And, so, and that's uh, a super statement. Remember when we do super BCFW, we shift everything. So we do this shift for both the uh, the bosonic and the fermionic components. Uh, but these brackets are only bosonic. Okay, so, so, okay? All right. And so, in the z-plane, I have a lot of poles. Right? In the z-plane, I have a lot of poles. I have a lot of poles here that exactly correspond to when n of z uh, 1 jj plus 1 goes to 0. And I know exactly the residue of those poles. Who is the residue of those poles? Exactly this picture. right? Because that's the n1 jj plus 1 factorization channel. OK? So the residue on those poles is given by this diagram. There's also a pole at infinity. Well, in, in principle, it's possible that there's a pole at, at infinity, right? We still have to worry about the pole at the infinity. Remember, it's a Cauchy's theorem argument, so we had dz over z. Now I have to worry about what happens as m of z goes to infinity. And what was cool about, uh, about Yang-Mills in ordinary momentum space is that magically the amplitude went to zero at infinity. So that, that pole at infinity was not there. What about here? Here there is a pole at infinity. Okay. 
But that's because this shift is kind of a, a different beast. What is z goes to infinity? What's little z goes to infinity here? Our shift is zn goes to zn plus little z, zn minus 1. So what happens as little z goes to infinity? Well, projectively, zn just goes to zn minus 1. This is not some special, funny, weird thing at infinity. In fact, we know exactly what the amplitude should be when zn goes to zn minus 1. It's the famous soft limit of gluon scattering amplitudes. And even if we didn't know anything else, what, I mean, if you just said, what should happen to the function? Zn, when you make one of the zn's equal to zn minus 1, just goes over into the n minus 1 point amplitude. Done. OK? So we know all the poles. The pole at infinity is just the soft limit, the one lower particle amplitude. By the way, why does this pole at infinity look funny in momentum twister space? This pole at infinity in momentum twister space corresponds to one of the BCFW terms that involves a three particle MHV amplitude on one side. Okay? So remember, in general, we have three part, you know, we have any, any amplitudes uh, bridged together, but there's some term that has the three particle uh, uh, MHV amplitude on one side. That piece with the three particle MHV amplitude on one side is not seen in momentum twister space because the MHV amplitudes are going to one. Okay? And so this is capturing that piece. So you can even sort of map all the BCFW terms down from one space to the other. So this little piece at infinity is just that guy. It's not special. I mean, I want to stress, this is not, it's not a special term, right? It's just uh, um, OK. But so now having seen that when we shift Zn to Zn plus something times n minus 1, the factorization channel that's exposed is the one that we've seen. Then I think now you should be convinced that the actual BCFW term that you get interpreted as on shell diagrams is just adding this bridge. Because that bridge is exactly enforcing the Zn goes to Zn plus something times Zn minus 1. Okay. So this is what the actual BCFW term looks like. The BCFW term associated with every one of these poles is just that momentum twister on shell diagram. Ha, momentum, I shouldn't call it that. That momentum twister playback graph. OK? And you can just work out what it is explicitly. Okay? In other words, you can work out what uh, you can just, yeah, you can work out uh, what it is explicitly. In terms of the left and the right, you just put the extra variables here. Uh, you do the boundary measurements. Um, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice computation. And here's the final answer. So this is tree-level BCFW in momentum twister space. So first of all, that's the answer at the level of the playback graphs. But at the level of the sort of functions, if you want to sort of just directly write down the uh, super amplitudes, uh, then we say that m for k and n for 1 through n is equal to, first, there's m of n minus k and n minus 1, 1 through n minus 1, plus, so that's the pole infinity that we just talked about, plus the sum over all ways of splitting n left, k left, n right, k right, and these interesting factors. So there is our friend, the R invariant, you remember this was our, our favorite five bracket object that we talked about over and over again. It's associated with a C matrix that's non-zero and five, just a one by n C matrix that's non-zero and five entries. Why should you not be surprised to see this guy? Because on the factorization channel, we needed to see the C matrix. Remember, on the upstairs of the C matrix was non-zero in the entries ii plus one, jj plus one. So those were the entries n one, jj plus one. And then when we add this bridge, we're just shifting the column n by something times uh, 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 n minus one by something times n, and so that's filling the that's filling in the uh, last uh, that's filling in the n minus one entry. 
Okay, so this is non-zero in five entries, jj plus one, n minus one, n one. So this is like the sort of top row. This is coming from the uh, top row of the C matrix. And then the, the, the rest is m, n, right, k, right, for one through j, i sub j, m, n left, k left, i sub j, j plus one, comma, n hat sub j. Where with, of course, n left plus n right equals n minus 2, k left plus k right equals uh, k minus 1, um, and uh, n hat j equals the intersection of the line n minus 1 with j, j plus 1, 1. And i is the intersection of j, j plus 1 with this plane n minus 1, n 1. Okay. Again, this would not surprise you because when we go on the factorization channel, i should be the intersection of jj plus 1 and n1. Okay. Okay, so that's it. That's a, that's a uh, completely concrete formula. There's nothing. You can just put this in Mathematica and press return. And if you're Jake Borgeli, you'll do it very beautifully. Um, and so, as, as I mentioned before, he has a package where in, in any form you want, if you want the tree amplitude, and it's fast. It can do it on, on your laptop, I think, up to 20 points. If you really want to experiment and see what amplitudes look like, you know, screw around with them, play. I, there's all sorts of actually very interesting phenomenological questions that people have not been exploring. Uh, anyway, I, that's another interesting topic for a project, just playing with these amplitudes, plotting them, seeing what they look like. No one has really done this, uh, but the, the data is sitting there and, and available. Um, um, but anyway, that's, that's what he's doing. Okay? So he's, uh, uh, this, is the, this is a very, very fast way of uh, actually generating the uh, generating, uh, tree amplitudes. And we've seen how they're all associated with these uh, playback graphs in momentum twister space. And um, okay. So to summarize, what we've seen is, um, uh, is um, how the, how the uh, positive structure of the amplitohedron gave us unitarity. So we saw unitarity at four particles at all loops. We saw unitarity at tree level. Um, even the, the, the nature of factorization was kind of made, was forced on us and made rather transparent by the uh, amplitohedron picture. So we then explored what uh, factorization looks like in momentum twister space and these practical things like figuring out what BCFW looks like in momentum twister space. The last qualitative thing, um, which I hope to do today, but I guess we'll, we'll do next time, is um, where does this, uh, is, is how to do loops in general. Okay? So I want to show you where loops in general come from. Um, and uh, of course, from the geometry and the amplitudinal point of view, we made this guess about hiding particles. Right? We made this guess about hiding particles to give us these new positive, uh, these new positivity rules. And we don't have a, uh, you know, just from that, there's no proof that it's right, but you compute a lot of things, it works, and then you also do these general checks like we did, like for the four point all loops. And we've seen very not, not non-trivially how unitarity uh, uh, comes out of these rules. Um, uh, but uh, next time I will begin by, um, by, uh, by giving a complementary sort of intuition um, and actually derivation for where loops come from. Um, uh, from the following uh, point of view, we're going to go back again to this idea of hiding particles, except we're going to do it not in some abstract place like the C matrix or the D, uh, um, but directly in momentum twister space. So we're going to imagine we have some amplitude, depends on a bunch of Zs, a bunch of particles, and I literally want to integrate out some particles. There are two particles, I hate them. I want to get rid of them, I'm going to integrate over them, right? Just literally integrate over them. Um, uh, 
And we're going to see that there is a sort of obvious way to integrate over particles one at a time. And this obvious way is not super interesting. It just corresponds to sort of getting rid of it, taking a soft limit. Um, in the language of the Grassmannian, it goes to a boundary of the Grassmannian, natural boundary of the uh, Grassmannian. So they're all very simple, very straightforward. You don't get anything interesting. But literally because we're in P3 and we have two points in P3, it turns out if you have a pair of points, there is another way to do the integral. There is another contour of integration that you can do. And the, this, so I'll just say what it is, and we'll see how it works more explicitly next time. But this is what the, what the picture is. I want to get rid of these two points. I want to integrate over them. But I'm going to integrate over them in two steps. First, I'm going to uh, take the, the two points, look at the line that, is, that they determine, and I'm first going to integrate over the points along that line. And then I'm going to integrate over all the lines. Okay. So in other words, I'm doing a partial integrating out first, where I integrate out the points just on the line. It turns out there's a completely canonical way of doing that integral by a residue. There's a totally canonical contour of integration that actually integrates you along the line. You can always do it algebraically just by taking a residue. And then you're left with the integral over the space of lines, which is nothing other than a loop integral. Okay? So that is actually a way that you can go from objects that depend on extra particle data, right? and by these entangled integration contours for pairs of them, you get loop integrands. So we'll see how that works in some simple examples. So, so you see sort of quite vividly how you start from some tree object and you end up with a one loop uh, integrand. And then we'll derive it from the, uh, the so-called forward limit and the single cut of the, uh, of the amplitudes. So, that, that's, uh, so there is a sort of honest derivation um, uh, that then really extends the tree level BCFW to all loop order. And uh, so there's just one more term that we have to write down, and then we'll have the recursion relation valid to all loops. Okay, thanks. <laughs>